All right, what's going on? So this next video, and I apologize, the uh, camera's not working. So it's still me though, still Willis here. The next topic we're gonna talk about in this video are values. So what are values? I know we hear that a lot, um, but it's hard to really define what they are. So here's my take on what values are. Our values are basically our personal rules. So we, we've already gone through, gone over learning the rules of the game in whatever arena that we're playing in. Next, and, the, and rules restrict what we can or cannot do, right? And now values further restrict what we can or cannot do. They're basically our personal rules. They're based on our basic or fundamental beliefs. They're based on our ethics. They're based on what we think is right or wrong, how we should conduct ourselves. And these rules that we kind of impose on ourselves guide or motivate our attitudes or actions. They also are a reflection of what we, what we find important. And again, they, they restrict what we think and say, what we can think, say, and do. There are self-imposed rules. So they also are the measuring sticks by which we determine what is successful, a successful, meaningful life as achieving success is really a subjective idea and is, and is depends on what, how we define being successful. Right. And so Mark Madsen has this joke of the productivity secrets of Adolf Hitler, where he's basically saying that, look, Hitler was very productive. I mean, you got to give the devil his due, right? He was able to do incredible things to, to lead a nation. However, perhaps his values were a bit astray and his definition of success may have been not what most of us would perceive as healthy. And so even though he, he was very great as a, as a leader and he was very productive and he was able to do these to get a bunch of people to, to, to follow his vision, his vision based in part by his values is ultimately what led to what occurred. And so kind of what I believe is that although we should seek to continually learn and strive for excellence, our self-worth should not be based on demonstrating superiority over others. Our definition of success should be based on what we can control, which is what's internal, how we define. So, and one of my favorite quotes is success is peace of mind, which is a direct result of self-satisfaction and knowing you did your best to become the best you're capable of becoming. It's by coach John Wooden, a UCLA basketball coach, I believe in the sixties or seventies. And how extern how externally successful we are in terms of our accomplishments is not nearly as important as our ability to improvise, adapt, and overcome. Our values are reflected in the way we choose to behave, not necessarily in just what we think and say, because some people will state values, um, but they don't actually embody them and they don't actually behave in accordance with those values. So here kind of the four plus one agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz. And these are basically agreements or rules that, that uh, he encourages us to follow to dramatically increase our happiness and well-being that we feel regardless of what our external circumstances are. So these in, in a sense are kind of like values. One is to be impeccable with our words, to speak with as much integrity and honesty and precision as we can so that we don't say anything that goes against our own best interests. I know that's a lot, that's a very difficult because, well, we say a lot all the time. So we wanna be as precise as we can. As we can. Second agreement is not to take anything personally. And this one is one I definitely have been on a journey to embody more of, just to realize that people, including myself, but everyone, all of us merely project our own reality and worldview. And so when we understand that, we realize that whatever people say or do, is just a ref reflection of their own worldview. And so that means that 
I shouldn't take, I shouldn't let the opinions of others affect my self image or my own satisfaction. Now, is it important to listen to the opinions of others, especially those we, we might respect or who are, who we feel has good opinions, of course, um, because our worldview may be warped at times and we need this social calibration. But if people are just being negative and, and saying, you know, hurtful things, you can, or doing hurtful things, you just realize that they're just projecting. And so, and it's really not about you, even if it seems like it is. Third is to not make assumptions. So this kind of goes uh, well with agreement one in that don't assume anything. And so ask questions, communicate clearly. And, you know, this avoids a lot of stress, sadness, misunderstanding, trauma, conflict, etc. An agreement for is to always do our best. So no matter what we're doing in life, including in trying to uphold these agreements, we just want to do our best. And we're not perfect. We're going to make mistakes. But we want to not be too hard on ourselves. And if we're doing our best and we're genu genuinely trying to get better and improve and grow, then that's all we can really ask for at the end of the day. And the fifth agreement is learn to be skeptical, but learn to listen. So be curious, understand what people are really trying to say, but also filter that with your own understanding of the world and see if it makes sense to you. Don't just blindly listen and follow whatever you might hear. Take it in and think about it. All right. This was just something that I was thinking about the great assumption in terms of morality, right? People ask like, what is morality? What is considered right or wrong? Who gets to make that decision? Um, is it based in religion? Is it based in tradition? Is it based in science, et cetera, et cetera. And this is what I've come up with. So our sense of morality is fundamentally rooted in this idea that for humans, life is greater than, in de than death. And we have an evolutionary urge or programming to keep surviving and reproducing, right? And so just as in nature, how whatever, organ whatever organisms can continue to survive and reproduce is by definition the fittest, whatever ethical ideas that maximally enhances our chance to successfully pass those ideas on, those ethics on, is by definition what we generally consider moral. So it's evidence-based, it's it can be based in science and the object and it's objective. It's the most moral thing we can do is technically whatever allows us to survive. And this is kind of the beauty of the Judeo-Christian Ten Commandments, because this is from Dr. Jordan Peterson, and he can explain it far better than I can. But basically, what they, how these emerged was there, there were thousands of years, let's say, of countless arbitrations of, of conflict between in a tribe, in a group of people. And, you know, they had to figure out what were the rules of being that promoted best promoted long-term peace and stability within, within a society. And because when there's peace and stability in the society, people have the best chance of successfully surviving and reproducing. And after, you know, many years of arbitrating, judging and settling conflicts, they came up with these 10 commandments that kind of emerged, especially the ones regarding like ethical, Things like don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat. Uh, I don't know if don't cheat is one of them, but like don't don't covet, um, don't kill. All these things is like, yeah, not doing those things helps people live longer and successfully raise children who can then raise their own children. And so that that's what we came up with. And but this is kind of as an aside during times of hardship, and this is my belief, maybe it's his as well, 
it's hard to stick to these Ten Commandments. Like when you're starving, it's hard to not steal, let's say. Uh, and so part of this idea of the eternal afterlife of heaven and health is just to keep people acting in terms of this bigger picture. Because, yes, in, in certain difficult times, it, it might seem easier to kill or to steal or to whatever. But in terms of the human population collectively or a certain society or tribe, that diminishes the tribe's overall ability to continue on. And so part of this idea of the, the eternally judging God with uh, eternal afterlife of heaven, hell is just to promote this idea like, hey, like you can, if you, if you break these commandments, you're still going to get in trouble. So what I'm really saying is like, maybe there's no such thing as an actually an actual hell in afterlife. It's more just an idea to keep people acting in accordance with the long-term focus, especially during times of extreme hardship. Let me know what you think about that. All right. Another, some great, other great ideas from Jordan Peterson regarding sports. It's an interesting one, one that, you know, is cool to think about because I mean, sports is essentially a watered down version of war, but it's now just basically a bunch of people running around playing with a ball or other some things just as silly. And it would seem like only kids would be interested in it, yet adults, especially adult males probably, continue to love sports, love playing sports, love watching sports, etc. And it would seem silly, except sports is actually far deeper than we realize. It's a great medium for life. Well, for one, they are games where the objective rules and strategies are pretty obvious. Another idea is that it's as close to a meritocracy as probably evident in life. The winners and losers are obvious. Who is better and who's worth worse is pretty obvious. And without cheating again, and there's largely an unambiguous path to success. Like it's pretty clear, like what you need to do to succeed in sports. And so sports heroes make a lot of money because they're, we believe they reflect admirable values and they're great in their domain of expertise. The other idea regarding sports is that it's not always about winning or losing, but about how you play the game. And this is where the values come in because a series life is a series of games and it's not just about winning one game. It's about how we should conduct ourselves so that we can maximize our chances of winning across time and being invited to play across time. And that's where values and sportsmanship comes into play. And so we see that in sports, but it's just as important in life. Now, the next few are from Mark Manson. So elevating our values. What are good values? What are bad values? Well, good values are based in evidence. They're constructive and they're controllable. Bad values are emotion-based, destructive, destructive and uncontrollable, right? So a good value, again, like I shared, is evidence-based. We have examples in history or in your own life where it shows following this certain value helps, helps you to essentially live longer or live better or more peacefully or more in a more stable way. It's also more controllable, and I'll get into this a bit more of how it's, it's internal and it's not based on things that we can't control. Constructive versus destructive values. Sometimes it can be a complicated line. For example, generosity, we generally consider that to be a, a good value, let's say. But in, as an example, in Pablo Escobar, he would give people money or give uh communities money so that they could do his dirty work or look the other way as he committed his crimes. So in that case, he was using generosity in kind of a negative way, in a destructive way. And so what we value is often not as important as why we value it. So, it's, so in terms of being generous, it's important to understand why, why we believe generosity is important. Now, Where am I? 
pretty much mentioned the rest. All right, when do we need to transform our values? So this is a difficult process, just like transforming beliefs, transforming values is a deeply personal process because, you know, values are kind of so deep in some people that it's hard for them to give up on certain values or certain beliefs about the world. And so the first step is it must be contradicted through experience or through taking it to its logical conclusion via conversation. Then we have to recognize that, okay, what we value has failed us. And it can either mean, again, either that the world sucks or that, or that we suck in terms of our value. Again, it, it can be a terif terrifying experience because these are some of our most deeply held beliefs and, and it forms a key part of our identity. So we'll often feel like we're losing a part ourselves because of that we'll have a tendency to resist or, and rationalize or deny that there's anything wrong with our values. So it's easier to blame the world and consider that we're the ones to blame. But ultimately, if you can recognize that uh, you're responsible and that your value has failed you, you must then pick a new value and take action in accordance with it and then assess how things turn out. So that's all I've got for this one. It was a bit of a long one. Hope you got something out of it and I will see you in the next one.